Stephen, you were born in Brisbane, um, and I'm curious if you could just take us through the, the, the tribes that you come from, because there are two or three different elements that I gather. Yeah, look, my, my, father's, uh, my father's a Mananjali man, so he's a freshwater man from Yugambi country, which is sort of uh, probably about 90 k's west from Brisbane, um, up pretty much the, uh, the border, the Bundjalung nation border between New South Wales and Queensland. And uh, my mother's a saltwater woman, so she's a uh, new knuckle, Nugi woman from, from Strebrick Island. Um, but I was brought up, I was born in Brisbane, uh, whereas I come from a family of 12. Uh, the, the older brothers and sisters, well, the older sisters, because there were six girls and uh, two older brothers uh, before I was born. Um, and uh, the majority of them were born in the fringe in a place called Bedezet, which was a community set up just where my father's family grew up. So majority of them were born there. And, uh, and it wasn't until, obviously, in 1965 when I was born. Uh, and I think my brother before me, they, my family shifted to Brisbane to a suburb called Mount Cravat. So I've spent basically my upbringing right up until I was 16 uh, in, in Brisbane. And uh, yeah, and then I... I tell, left tell, us Sydney. Tell us about your family. Um, six sisters. Look, working class, six, six boys, six girls. Uh, I think I went three girls, a boy, three girls, and then five boys. Um, yeah, look, I think we spent our whole lives uh, in an urban environment. And, uh, you know, mum and dad had a myriad of jobs um, whilst mum was, was having children. Um, and, you know, working class, uh, and they all they did was trying to keep a roof over our head and food on the table. So um, so it was quite um, chaotic and um, and wonderfully dysfunctional because it was, you know, that many kids in the family. And, and <coughs> when you say dysfunctional, but in a good way, I presume? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm celebrating the, the, the dysfunctionalness of what that was. Um, Look, uh, yeah, and, and you, we'd always have uh, gatherings and on weekends and cousins would come from Dad's country, freshwater country, and cousins would come from my mother's side. And I think it's because we had one of the biggest families off throughout all the cousins and families. And uh, uh, mum and dad were great sort of hosts in terms of bringing people together. And um, I can always remember just gatherings and... Um, and lots of parties because it was, <laughs> it was, um, and there was always sort of entertainment. There was always gathering of guitar playing and talking and and storytelling. And um, and I, I remember that um, quite vividly, actually. To, did you look up to your father? Was he kind of a hero figure to you? Oh yeah, look, I think my father. It wasn't until later on in life my my father and I. Uh, connected quite strongly uh, and until I moved to Sydney, until I started working uh, in, in the arts. And, um, but our upbringing, we hardly ever seen, seen our father. I mean, sorry, our father. I mean, he, he'd always, he's working, hard worker. He was a concreter, landscaper. Uh, you know, he went out and did timber cutting. He was a jack of all trades, you know. And, and my father was in a, you know, this is, would have been, you know, for me, late 60s, early 70s. And uh, so um, for him, uh, you know, a great labourer, you know, and, uh, but at the same time, my father was hiding um, a bit of, a, a bit of social pain because for him, you know, majority of the people he was working with, or what he would call his mates, uh, majority of them were, you know, starting to start up their own businesses and getting loans for houses and my father, being Aboriginal at that time, you know, couldn't get a loan and uh, was probably a better worker, he, you know, than they would all rely on he, him for his skills. So he was quite frustrated by all of that. So there was that subtlety of discrimination and racism. And it was probably the first time when I was about 10 that I would have sort of, uh, you know, he took to drink and he, um, you know, you, you could sense there was a frustration. and. And I, that was in our household and our upbringing quite earlier on about discrimination and racism. Um, you know, and, and for me, I was quite fair um, compared to a lot of my brothers and sisters. I, I think there's only about three kids out of the 12 that are, are fair skin. And so, uh, you know, um, my father's, 
he's black, you know. <laughs> and uh, so it didn't, it wasn't so hard for me at school, but I was aware um, of that. So that would be the strongest thing I remember from my father, that, uh, you know, he was very proud of who he was, but also at the same time, he was quite frustrated. And from what you're saying, obviously the, the, the sense of, your family and the community mm. was, and the culture was very strong. Yeah, look, uh, Dad was always, um, you know, there was no living traditional language living in the family. Um, we would always go back to Dad's country or Mum's country and visit cousins and families. Uh, there were a few elders that were still alive and, uh, you know, uh, my older sisters and brothers would have had more connection with Dad's mum, who uh, my grandmother, who died when I was quite young, at about three or f about four or five, um, and uh, she um, she spoke language, you know, right up until she passed. Um, so our connection to language and culture and story was probably in that earlier period of uh, you know throughout the seventies and stuff when um, a lot of those elders were still alive and passing on information. So, um, you know, culturally, I think uh, we were still intact with um, um, community. Mm. And what was, how was uh, family discipline maintained? What was the sort of regime? Oh, no discipline. <laughs> uh, look, I, I think you just, you know, as I said, you know, they were getting a roof over their heads, food on the table. Uh, you know, the, the girls were working at the age of 14, 15, you know, in shoe factories, biscuit factories, pineapple canneries. I mean, you know, people, it was getting out there and, you know, different work ethic compared to today. So um, there was one. Well, there was discipline in that sense, <laughs> yes. yeah. Uh, in terms of the household, you know, you, you know, you, I was cooking for my brothers at the age of 10, you know, I mean, you were... You had to, you know, if you lived off the same spaghetti for a week, that's all you had, you know, and, and um, you know, so it was tough, you know, and, and uh, the materialistic things weren't even on offer, you know. We'll get to how you became a dancer in a moment, but just before we do, I'm just curious about, you know, how you look back on that period of your life. Do you think of it as formative to you? Does your sense of identity come from there? Uh, it, it probably came to me much, it would have been a, st a stronger sense of reflection when I went through dance college. Uh, and I would think the more creative artistic side was probably more driven in my earlier upbringing. So, I mean, I was culturally aware of uh, a much more urban social environment in community, in, in black community. Uh, but as in culturally traditional living um, indigenous culture, it was a lot, it was, it was later on in life for me. Yeah. So in fact, you weren't, uh, you, you didn't go through the Traditional, for example, dance. I'm thinking particularly as you're a dancer. No, no, no. no traditional no. dance. No, we were totally urban upbringing. Yeah. There was no traditional song or traditional dance. Uh, you know, and it wasn't until later on when I went through dance college that, or when I first experienced my relationship with, you know, traditional communities, uh, if I'd come back and share those stories with my mother and father, that they would then start to talk about what they were remember hearing traditional language or song and dance you got to remember they came from a generation where it was assimilated from them so they weren't allowed to celebrate their identity um, so for them it was that you know a tough generation I mean my father till he was 80 would stand on the side of the road and let a white man walk across the road before himself would walk you know like he they come from a completely different generation. So for them, it was just about surviving. As I said before, the food on the table, getting a roof over your head and 12 kids. So a lot of those cultural values and principles, you know, were, was taken away from their families. I mean, he comes from, a, they both come from stolen generations. They, you know, his sisters were taken away from him, you know. So there's a lot of, 
they come from that wounded generation, you know, of, of not celebrating their identity. You say you kind of started to get a sense of this uh, from about the age of 10. Did it, did it have a significant impact on you at all in those early years? Or was it only, as you say, later? Yeah, uh, I think the main impact would have been later. I mean, I can remember later on in life thinking about when I was 10 and saying, oh, that connects that dot. That is why my father acted like that. Um, I don't think I was, you know, that fully aware at the age of 10 and saying, you know, there's a cultural problem here amongst my family. Um, but you obviously, and that's with anybody, I mean, you don't really reflect back. Um, I mean, your childhood memory stuff are much more potent in your, in your older ages, or well, maybe not too old. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, yeah, so for me, it would have been more about just uh, living in an urban environment and surviving in a big family. So you didn't rebel against that because there was nothing to rebel against? No, there was a slight... Um, There was probably a drive in me about wanting to get away from the chaos because it was quite, you know, there was a lot of kids and, you know, as I was getting into high school, the older brothers and sisters were moving away from home. Um, and I was always, um, I knew I was no good at sport. My brothers were really great at football. I think I tried one game and I scored for the other team and that was not the right thing to do. Um, I was always involved in the arts. I, as long as I can remember, I was all, you know, we were, we were doing performances since we were, you know, seven or eight years old, you know, our sisters would dress us up and we'd perform on the laundry roof for neighbours and, you know, there was always music and the, the girls were always into popular music and they influenced us a lot with, 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 with music and dance and, and performing. And um, so by the time I got to high school, uh, you know, I was choreographing and directing end of year performances, you know, in, in, in year 10 and 11. So I, I sort of knew straight away I wanted to be in the arts from, you know, probably from the age of 13, 14. How did your parents respond to that? What was their attitude? Look, mum and dad, long as you were happy and you were, you know, they... You know, and they were into old school things, you know, they, you know, you get out there and you go and work and you, I mean, my father probably, you know, when I first said I was going to dance college, just thought you couldn't make a profession out of that, you know, um, and, uh, But he didn't try and stop you? No, no, I, um, <laughs> well, I was, well, I was actually left in year 11 high school and, um, my mum said I didn't get a, I, anyway, it was a, cut a long story short, I, was expelled for a week and uh, and that was because I was rebelling towards a history teacher who I wanted to know why we weren't doing Aboriginal history and uh, and I think I challenged that and then I went to the principal's office and then I was suspended for a week and my mother said because none of the uh, the brothers and sisters made it through to grade 12 so I was probably one of the first to get to go through to grade 12 and um, I almost got there and um, yeah, and mum said, well, if you don't find a job in a week, you're going back. So I was pretty um, determined to find a work because I didn't want to go back to that school. And, uh, and I ended up working in the Aboriginal Trust Trade under legal service, um, which <laughs> once again changed my life a bit more because, uh, you know, you're working with in law and you're working... It's completely urban black law. Is complete, and that's my, that was my first taste of social black activism, really. Um, you know, I'm, I'm with people like Vivian Walker and Kath Walker and, and some great people uh, who uh, whose minds and their knowledge about social black activism was was pretty intense. And, and um, so I got a taste of that. And that's where I saw the careers and dance advertisement on a poster, uh, which was posted at that uh, in that office that I was working in. And so it was only like six months later before I put in an application and I don't know, I think my cousin signed the application and, um, you know, my mum just went, oh yeah, sure, dance, that's where you're going. And um, I think like two months later, yeah, I was on a plane to Sydney. Um, yeah. So, I, and I think for my father, you know, he just thought Sydney, he just thought King's Cross, he just thought 
danger, you know, like, you know, where are you going? Um, but at the same time, I think that they just had faith in me going. Um, Did you have faith in you? Well, I must have. I was keen to get out of there. I don't know if I was keen to get out just to get away from the chaos and the family. But, um, but my mother said I was always quite determined and I was always... I'd always rather be on my own. I was always, you know, either creating something in the corner and I'd, you know, I was always either painting or, you know, she said I was always creatively doing something. Um, drawing on? I don't know what it was. She just said, uh, just just drawing on being on my own and just being creative on my own. And, um, yeah, she, I think she might have been slightly worried about it, but she uh, there was too much going on. Um, but, you know, I, I was 12 when my older brother died in front of my mother and I. So, you know, like, we ha I, had, I had experienced death in front of me. So for me, um, that could have probably had a lot to do with it too. That probably changed. Um, How did he die? He had epilepsy and he died actually in, in a fit. And um, we had no phone, we had nothing on um, in the house and my mother was hysterical and, uh, and we, we knew and there was the old days where you, you, know, you, where you weren't allowed to put anything in his mouth and all that sort of stuff and you know, laying him on the side and I, we, you know, we all had a routine to do. It got to the point where he would just take you know, a, a fit and there might be a family fight going on and poor old Philip be having a fit and someone would be attending to him while the fight's still going on. So it almost became like it was part of... <laughs> the, 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 the family chaos um, and he took a fit one day and um, he actually wasn't feeling well I remember he rarely sat in the sun and that morning he sat in the sun and I said to mum he doesn't look really like his colour was looking a little bit different and, um, and he took a turn in the lounge room and I just heard something fall and so I went to go and get his medicine thinking because I just knew I thought he's He's taken a turn. But when I come back, Mum said he wasn't coming out of it. And by that time, I had raced down the road because there was a nurse down the road and come back and he had passed, yeah. So, but the, the odd thing about that was our place always had people in it and this day there was only my mother and I. So I think for me that was a really hard time for me because I just sort of... Um, watching your mother and her child, one of her children, um, um, pass in front of you and be a part of that. So, and you know, it wasn't, you know, you wouldn't get counselling or anything or you wouldn't, you know, you, in big families, you just sort of had to suck it up and take it as an experience and that's your fate and you know, you just sort of move through. And, and, I, and I probably think after that, I sort of, I did go into slight isolation because I just sort of, didn't want to deal with anything and I was pretty strong on uh, you know I, I think I was doing acting courses when I was 14 and I think the first little welfare of Aboriginal ab study came out and you know I came at a time at that time and you know I, I think I indulged in that and did acting course and I did a DJ course and so um, and I think that's probably part of grieving still because you're probably you know you you're trying to occupy yourself and I found art as a great medicine like I just really felt anything that was to do with expression and listening to music and creating and telling stories um, uh, was a great way to heal and cleanse. Do you think of people from that part of your life did you was there anyone there that that was kind of a a hero figure, a, a mentor figure? Uh, I, you know, my mother would have been... My mother was... A, we were a lot closer to our mother. Um, as Dad got on and the older boys went to work with Dad, you know, the younger ones, myself, my brother Lawrence and my baby brother Russell, we were a lot closer to Mum. Um, and I didn't play sports, so I didn't... You know, I would be the odd one out... You know, I went to a few football games and played, and 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 um, you know, if you, I missed. There was a there was a sort of a contemporary initiation for us men, and that was for us boys. And and by the time you got sixteen, you got to learn the you know the mechanics of how to put a car together, and you know you got to get your drivers. Your dad would take your driving lesson, and and I had missed out on all of that because I took off to Sydney and led my own sort of direction. And so my bond with my father then wasn't, there was no bond really. Um, 
but he was very supportive. Um, so is, was there, through my mother, he would be supportive. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Was there any other male figure? That uh, you... there was. Uh, you know, look, you, you've got your older brothers, but I mean, they, they weren't that much older than me. They, you know, they were three to five years older than me. Uh, no, I didn't have any other male figures uh, at that time until probably until I left and went to college. Yeah. And at when you came to Sydney, did you find that uh, you fitted in? Well, you know, you come to Sydney. What would that have been? Eighty one, eighty two. Um, interesting time as well. Um, and you've got this college, a base in Sydney, a stomping ground where there's all walks of life of Indigenous youth wanting to have a career in dance and performing arts. Um, quite a really unique sort of setup. Um, majority of uh, the youth were, you know, uh, I'd say the majority of people probably. 60% would have been, um, or maybe a bit more, urban upbringings. So, um, and a lot of them, it was a bit like going to sort of some sort of cultural identity, sort of university identity college or something, you know, because you're coming in there and, and that's one of the hardest things. It wasn't just about the dance. It was really about connecting back, rekindling back to culture um, because you would have uh, elders that would come from certain living language, song and dance communities that would come back, come down to the college and city and they would... Um, pass on their knowledge as part of uh, the course. But then you'd learn all other uh, facets of art uh, movement from, from you know, modern dance to classical to, uh, to a whole array of um, dance forms. But the biggest injection was the traditional influence from both Aboriginal and Torres Strait. S certain irony there that you didn't really have a, a, a cultural upbringing as a child. It really came later. Yeah, it came a lot later, and, uh, between when I was 16 and 19. Mm. And the beautiful thing about that is when I first went at the end of, when I was about 17 and a half, and went to North East Arnhem Land, um, I got adopted into a family there because it was part of a, a traditional remote trip that we would do, part of the course. At the end of every year, you would go uh, back to the community that was generous in offering their cultural knowledge. And um, I got to dance in a big corroboree there, and it was great. And then I was dancing with another uh, traditional Yungo boy at the time who ended up becoming my brother. It was it, it, in this beautiful way through the dance and mimicking each other. That's how I was adopted into his family. And, so, and you know, we're still brothers today. Um, so I think it was through that hearing living language and, and then really being frustrated by it because... That's when I had the dilly bag of ideas in my head or questions about what happened to our culture um, through my mother and father's side. So it wasn't until I went back home for Christmas festive times uh, and my father actually picked me up from the airport the old days of TAA or ANSET or whenever it was and, you know, spear, I had given, been given spears and artefacts and the days where you could carry everything on a plane. And... Um, he saw me coming and I must have, I was the blackest I've ever been, you know, after being the fairest in the family. And I'd been in Arnhem Land for a while and he just had this little tear in his eye because it was the first time and I was showing, I think I had Polaroid images uh, where there was this sea of beautiful black faces and this fair little thing in the middle. And uh, he, um, yeah, that, that, that trip home from the airport to home and the old sort of, the old valiant, um, yeah, we got to talk about culture for the first time and that's when we really bonded uh, because I was curious and asking questions about language and grandma's stories and uh, he just couldn't believe that I was connecting. And I think for him that it made him reflect as well, yeah. In your experience, uh, especially in those early days, but, but throughout uh, over the last 20 odd years, did you come across um, Aboriginal, young Aboriginal males who didn't have that connection with culture? Oh, yeah. And how would you, what was, what was different about them? Young males at the time, when I started working professionally? Yeah, I'm yeah. just curious whether you noticed the difference between those who were connected to their culture and those who weren't. Oh, totally, yeah. Uh, 
I think since I've been at Bangara and look, it's, it's, it's a really tricky thing because my personal life experiences are almost the principles of what set Bangara up, if that makes sense. I mean, you know, here I was, an urban upbringing, got, was, had the fate of connecting back to culture through dance and there's a professional clan, contemporary dance theatre clan that's built from that experience really at the end of the day, 23 years later. So the majority of dancers, of men, young boys that want to come through the company, the, the majority want to connect back to culture. The majority uh, know their family, know their community, but there's that element of frustration of wanting to know more. And so through Bangara, they feel uh, they get the opportunity to connect with living language and song. And, you know, we still have those relationships. That's why it's important for Bangara to have um, these great community connections of uh, families that are, are, are so generous in, in, um, in entrusting us, I suppose, um, with that knowledge and, and allowing that to, um, uh, to be the connection for us to live in this sort of contemporary theatrical expression that we live in professionally. And those who you've met, I'm just, what I'm curious about is whether you've seen examples of the difference that culture makes as a way of finding one's identity and finding one's, you know, to get rid of the anger and, and all those negative issues. Yeah, look, I, it's depending depending on the boys. Like, I've, I've you know, separate from for my boys coming through the company because they'd have a different discipline, they'd different type of upbringing um, and um, you know and some have had uh, it, it varies you know um, but then if you're if you've got boys that um, you know that you're doing workshops with and there's a you know and you try to use dance and culture connecting them to dance and culture as part of a medicine or part of a an awareness um, then um, it's somehow um, through storytelling and through in telling your experiences, um, uh, it, yeah, it releases some of that frustration. Does your involvement, which has been pretty heavy uh, and, and pretty well focused on mm. Aboriginal culture, does your professional life have room for anything else? <laughs> are, you, are you saying, do I have a personal time for myself? Yes. Um, not really. No. Uh, <laughs> I, it's, and I've got to be careful because it's such a, um, a wonderful obsession and addiction and, um, and the older I get, uh, it's, uh, I've got to be careful that I allow and find that time for myself to, um, yeah, to have some time. But, you know, but then my job takes me to places where I get though I'll get some of that time, you know. If um, you know, if I'm going out to have discussions with community in Mutajulu community, Ni Uluru, you know, and if I go and <laughs> sit at sunset or sunrise and in front of Uluru for 15 minutes, I mean, to me, that's that's healing and cleansing because you know it's you don't get to speak, you don't need to speak, and you just inhale and exhale this beautiful um, energy that's symbolically connected to our culture that for me it's moment I get the privilege I get the opportunities to to go back on country uh, to feel connected to land and country and I think that's the big important thing through most of my experiences of why I am so wonderfully addicted to my job because I feel through my profession that I get to cleanse as I go along. And everyone else that I channel into that has the same experience. In Bangara, because of the time involved and because you're the head honcho, <laughs> uh, uh, are you the, the elder and, and how do you deal with the responsibility of that? Yeah, I'd love to call my, you know, is there such a thing as a contemporary young elder? Um, yeah, look, as a contemporary elder, I mean, I, uh, you know, the, uh, the elder status is a, is a big one. Uh, but I have learnt uh, probably only over the last decade, though, to accept that responsibility because I, 
and I, and I think it's the amount of energy and the amount of uh, spiritual faith that's been given on the, the company as well. And and I think when you're building beautiful relationships with communities that really know that what you're doing is an optimistic spiritual good thing. It's good. It's good for community. It's good for environment. It's good for social environment. It's good for the human spirit. And in that sense, I think it, as challenging as it is, I, I, I think I had to accept that responsibility to be this generation's elder, um, to, um, yeah, to, to, to lead and direct them into the future. We talked a lot, or you mentioned a lot, about the, the power and the cleansing, healing powers of going to, back to country. country yeah. A lot of urban Aboriginals don't have a country to go to or mm. don't know how to get mm. to it. What advice can you give them and what Look, can be done for them? It's, it's interesting you say that because through, you know, we do our main stage performances, we do a lot of regional touring. So, for example, we were doing a regional touring of New South Wales, which we're starting to embark on in about a month and a half. Uh, we'll go out to the sort of regional mainstream venues, uh, but at the same time we connect with community on the ground and a lot of youth, you know, and usually a lot of, you know, secondary students, high school students, we'll do workshops with. And and, um, and a lot of that, our dancers will then take on that sort of responsibility to tell stories about their experiences. Um, and usually within that storytelling, it's not just about the dance steps. It is about their life experiences, about them being urban, uh, them going back to country. And through dance, they're able to connect their spirit and land together, which is a great sense of healing. And uh, and they've got that worked out. It's a bit like their own little sort of Bangara Bible in a way, um, where they can pass that on to especially young uh, young men and women. And I guess in your job, more perhaps than in many jobs, yeah. you you are able to... Um, rehearse and exercise your personal philosophies about life because yeah. of what you do. Tell us a little bit about, are you able to articulate philosophies of how you live or is it just very instinctive? Oh, it, it's, it's very instinctive. My, and it's the same the way I work. I start with a blank <laughs> piece of canvas. I mean, I have one little visual idea in my head and the next minute it's a hour and 10 minute physical choreographic piece on stage and someone says, how do you do that? Um, if I spent my whole time analysing how I do that, I, I don't think I'd be surviving 23 years down the track. It is such an organic process. like, um, And it's a, it's a very challenging one to live in a modern day working in, in well, time management, I suppose, in that situation. Sure, look, we have a programme, we have a schedule, we have deadlines. Uh, but the flesh gut in the middle of those deadlines and stuff is very much organic. And I try to, one of the beautiful things I've learned to be is, uh, well, A, surrender your ego, because um, I think that's a Western thing. Um, and to trust your instinct and to trust your inner spirit. And that's something I've learned from connecting back, going back to country. Um, I think part of the Bangaras professional dance ensemble once a year in their program diet a year, they have to go back on country to become three-year-old children again, to surrender the city energy, to just connect your feet to the earth and not talk and just listen. And it's the most simplest thing, um, yet it's the most hardest thing to get people to do. And have you seen people change? Oh, totally. Uh, I've, well, not instantly, but you see them change because they want to talk about it. They want to talk about how they're feeling about after some, an experience like that. Um, but they'll brew and they will swallow the intention of that experience and they'll come back. But usually for us it's part of for the professional creative development as well as personal. So we try to do the both. You know, so that it's a nice balance for them. You know, so they they personally get it, and when they come into a professional rehearsal room to create a dance about a particular experience being on country, then they're able, and that's where dance is such a beautiful medium because you you're not using your voice, which I'm doing a lot now, but it's your body and your spirit that's that's 
that's healing through it. That's why sportsmen and women, especially sportsmen, it's it's the physicality, you know, and and there are other layers in that because their ego or their spiritual ego is being challenged, and it's being all the things that make up a man, <laughs> all those endorphins are being played out. So at the same time, there's a spiritual um, serpent within them that's being satisfied as well. And and I find that's the same with um, with with male dancers uh, in a, in the contemporary world today, drawing on traditions. Do you find yourself that the physicality of dance helps you overcome or manage? Periods of stress or trauma, personal. Yeah, yeah. Look, I think when my brother passed away in two thousand and two through suicide, uh, the one thing that I felt, or what naturally happened, was through dance and ceremony, it was one of the the best ways to sort of heal and cleanse through, not knowing if it was right or not. Um, and I felt it was probably better than, you know, a lot of Western advices, I suppose, devices. And, and, I, and I think for me, continuing uh, celebrating his legacy and the spirit of that through, through movement and music and, and ceremony was um, a great way to heal. I want to ask you, referring back to what you were saying about how you grew up in this um, <coughs> large and chaotic family. Um, yeah, I'll make it sound like it's terrible. No, it sounds fun. No, it sounds yeah. fun. But I'm curious, how, as an adult, how have you and how do you relate to, in relationships to women and to men? You can do it in whichever order you like. How do we relate? How do you personally relate to men and to women? Do you find it easy? From either or both sexes? It's, it's funny in Bangara because, and I've never really thought about this, why I always have six women and six men. Um, <laughs> just coincidentally, coincidentally, the same number of sisters and it's brothers. It's my brothers, yeah, yeah. It just, <laughs> it just hit me the nail on the head. Uh, well, I have six women and I have six men in the company. And... Um, when we are doing something that's more inspired, and oddly enough, next year's production is about men's business in the 21st century and women's business, and then the third section's about uh, the respect for both genders and how that works. And we, lay, we go up to Arnhem Land in February to go into Homeland and, and, and to Outstation to where these discussions will be talked to with elders and this clan of Bangara. And, you know, we'll do women's things and men's things and we'll talk through women's business and men's business and we'll talk through uh, a discussion. I try to be quite... I allow the respect for women and I allow the respect for men in rehearsals and I think when something's more specific towards women and there's women's pieces, then, uh, you know, there's a different, there's a different respect. And then, then, the, then, then the male, there will be a, a different way. But usually in Bangara's work, there's lots of ensemble work of men and women trying to find a cohesive pulse or balance for respect for each other. And if that's just within their energy on stage, respecting that, then that's what you see. Uh, and someone says to me, why in every production that you do in your, all your productions, you'll have an ensemble piece that tries to, and I have no idea why I do that, you know, and I think that's just part of the process and, and creative therapy that you probably go through. And it's probably a cultural principle. Um, but yet traditionally times have have evolved in those customs in 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 um, in living traditions as well. Like they they've slightly evolved, and and um, that's what would be very very interesting about going back, looking of what's in um, in traditional customs compared to how that shift today. And does that uh, translate into your personal life, your relationships, well, that ease of both genders? Yeah, it's 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 it's. I've never really thought about it. I, I have the same amount of. Um, oh, look! It's dynamically different. Women and men are dynamically different. Like mm. you, it's that's just natural. And and they. Um, but my relationship with the male members and the female members of the company is 
very much on the same par. I mean, and there is some sacred men stuff that you do and sacred women stuff that I don't need to hear about or, you know, and that's, that is fine as well. Gender but culture. Gender culture. And, and yeah. but, that, but that's respected, you know. Um, mm. And it's odd, though, the women will open to me a lot more than the men. The, not that odd. Well, it's not that I, I think that's just normal. And, yeah. and uh, yeah, the boys, I've got to dig a lot harder to, for them to, uh, yeah, to them to be um, honest to themselves. Mm. What, do you find that easy? Do you, do you find that? Uh, I find easier with probably the women. Uh, I find it, uh, it's a lot more challenging with the men. But yet, I probably would get a quicker outcome with the men if I was to have a discussion where I probably would get a much more quicker outcome mm. than I would with the women, and I don't know why. But, but obviously <laughs> you're comfortable talking to men or women, so there's no... Yeah, I really yeah. channel and sit in the middle of yes. it. It's very bizarre, and I've never thought about it that way, but it's quite an odd position to be in, maybe a unique position to be in, but yeah, I, I, uh, yeah I've, I've ha I have very much the same respect from both sides, and, and for them as well. So in terms of um, spirituality, yep. it's coming through culture, I gather. Um, or is there something else? Do you have a faith? No. Oh, well, obviously, Aboriginal spirituality is something yep. that's, um, that's very strong to me. And um, the more I hear those creation stories, mythological stories, I mean, I sort of relate them to quite strong, well, to the world of spirituality. Uh, and I'm very fortunate to, like I said before, have living traditional clans that are able to, to share that with myself and, um, and the company. So, um, I think the more you are on country and you're here and you come back to the city and you, you live in this wonderful schizophrenic sort of, the word schizophrenic is probably a bit hard, but I mean. It's two sided, it's two different. It's two, uh, we streams. always want, the, look, yeah. everyone looks for a perfect balance, a foot in both worlds. And we have accepted that our fate is about a foot in both worlds. And I think you just got to learn to, 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 a bit like riding a, surfboard on a wave really like you've you know it's a different temperament each time depending on how the waves roll in and roll out um but um but for me it's um yeah we've been very fortunate to have those experiences mm. let me ask you about this in the in the unlikely event that you need a crutch for some reason you know personal stress or mm. some problem that you want to solve mm. what do you use what do I use um, besides Western medicine? <laughs> uh, I presume you don't mean drugs. <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, do you use spirituality? Do you talk yeah, about yeah. it? It's mainly just talking. It's really just about cleansing oneself into eating good food, um, creating a space where it feels cleansed. Um, you know, music's always a huge influence. Um, does that does that calm you? Yeah, yeah. Or leaving the city energy is always a good thing. Uh, long walks is always a great thing. Um, what about instant f do I, instant I, fixes? I, instant fixes for for you know, like for example, you something that oh, annoys I, you or irritates you sort of extremely for briefly. <laughs> do you lose your temper? Uh, I have been known to lose my temper, uh, but I don't like losing my temper. And when I do, I'm the first to cleanse myself out of it. I can lose my temper and then I can quickly take a really deep breath and just step away from it. Let it go. And let it go. I, I will never hang on to anything on the same day something does happen. Like I will try to let it go and... 
step away from it, really, and let it breathe for a while, and and then try to come back to it. Yeah. Okay. One final question. <laughs> Inspiration. Inspiration. I know. I know you can't answer where it comes from because you don't know. Nobody knows. But is there anything that you do consciously to put yourself in the frame of mind or in the situation where you are inspired in some mystical way? Is there a place you go? Is there music you play? Uh, it's yeah, probably, probably odd certain choices of music, um, photography. Uh, once again, I think it's really, I'm very fortunate that my job and when I go back to country and coming off country and that thing of being a foot in both worlds, I mean, the more I can, you get back on country somewhere or you get to an atmosphere where you know there's a great spiritual connection, I mean, that's that's probably the biggest inspiration for me because I think it's where, and, and that's the thing of being in the city, you know, we all take such short breaths in the city. And I think when you're on country, you take deeper breaths. And um, I probably don't, don't need to tell you that. But I think when you inhale and exhale a lot deeper, I think, you know, it's probably... People forget about breathing, but because I work in dads, it is... It's the best, you know, remedy. And um, so breathing in a, in a good, sacred place is probably where I get my inspir biggest inspirations from. Do you have a... Uh, any sort of mantras or golden rules about life at all that you've learned? <laughs> that life's an illusion. <laughs> and we're all spirits walking. Um, That's a way of seeing the world. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I work from such inside out, like I work from such an organic place. and I. Just, so you're always bearing yourself. Is that what yeah, saying? yeah, and I rely on spiritual faith and I rely on... I think it's the thing of respect and it's all those great... You know, I suppose when you work with a culture that is as old as Aboriginal culture um, and its principles and its theories and its... It, it's just a shame the English language could never really explain the true spirit of Indigenous Aboriginal culture. Uh, and I wish there was one Aboriginal domestic language that was able to bridge the both together because then I'd have the answers for you today. <laughs> well, thank you very much. We'll live in hope and maybe... <laughs> that domestic one language will evolve in yeah. our future. Oh, I've told all my black political peers, I said, you know what? If you got all the thousand and one dialects together and you created a, a respected language that all Australians can speak, oh, my Lord. You might cleanse the the whole political guilt that's been blanketed over us for 240 years. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you. <laughs>